three. Welcome, welcome everyone to this special Wednesday episode. Uh, we are live in the Nutmeg Tavern and we are here for the very first episode of the Townsend's Book Club. And we're covering the very beginning part of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. And as is so usual here uh, on the Townsend's channel, this is highly experimental. So I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do this book club. All, the way, all I know is that we're going to do it. And it may change over time. We're going to find the best way, the best, you know, kind of the way to make this thing happen. Um, I will ask you for your advice, but go ahead and hold it uh, for later on. Let's just try this as it goes. And, um, at, you know, later on, maybe at the end of this episode or in comments or the second episode, you can chime in and say, hey, you should do it like this or that. That would be great. Um, so uh, it's going to take us a while to get through this because, I mean, an hour long live stream and I feel like, well, I've only gotten through the first 10 pages of <laughs> the autobiography. Uh, so in what I think is where we're going to get for this episode, not that I have only read 10 pages, but um, so we're going to have fun with this and uh, feel free to jump into the chat section with questions. You might want to hold questions for a little bit until we kind of get into it. Um, and if you're watching this as a recorded thing, then hey, def definitely drop your questions into the comments and we'll get them as we go into future episodes. And this is a back and forth. This isn't just me, um, but you know, your questions and your input, it's great. If people have questions in the chat and they need an answer and you have an answer, jump in there and do that. That'd be great too. I am joined in the studio by Ryan, who you will just hear as a disembodied voice. Hello, guys. It's good to see you today. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble with technical stuff, so make sure that you put in the chat whether or not you can see us and hear us okay. Wow. Can you see us and hear us? I mean, really? That's what happens when we have non-experts on the console. Mm. This is true. Mm. So, uh, Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, if you need a copy, you can find it on our website. Although we did have a little problem. We discovered <laughs> one of our wonderful readers was going through it and says, John, you know, there are two pages missing in your book. Pages 52 and 53 were gone. If you've got a copy that you got from us, pages 52 and 53 are gone. Uh, get with customer service. They've probably already gotten with you about what we can do to fix that for you. And uh, they will be available. Books with 52 and 53 will be available on our website uh, as soon as they're here from the printer. Shouldn't take very long. It looks like we're looking good and sounding good. And Excellent. yeah, guys, this is not the normal live stream. Right. We're not still going to do that on Friday. Yep. It's normal live stream on Friday. This is a special in the middle of the week, we're going to be doing this for quite a while, uh, trying to get through this. Benjamin Franklin is so important to the 18th century. He's a great person to understand well uh, because he's so famous. We know about him, but he isn't um, somebody who is a high birth person. You know, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He wasn't born rich or from an influential, influential family. Uh, so this autobiography isn't about a super, in, you know, rich, influential person growing up. So really, really helpful for us to understand the 18th century, even from a common man's point of view. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was born in 1706. He died in 1790. So he is firmly in the 18th century. He doesn't go out, you know, past it. Um, He's writing this, at least the first part of his autobiography, in 1771 when he was 65. And so there's a, still a lot of his life left. Some of the most important things that he's going to do as Benjamin Franklin, he does after this time period. So it's really helpful in, for us to see what his formation is like. Um, so great. And it is definitely a rags to riches kind of story. Here's the very beginning. He says, Having emerged from poverty and obscurity into which I was born and bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world. So even by 1771, he felt like he had, uh, you know, a state of affluence and, and a reputation in the world. And yet, you know, he was... Again, not, not born of some massively influential family, not with a lot of money. Why does 
he write this? Is it pure vanity? And he talks about vanity in here. It's fun, fun little piece where he talks about, you know, as soon as somebody says, you know, I, I don't want to write, you know, in a, in a vain sense, and then immediately they say vain things. Um, but here is what he says about sort of the why um, that he's writing this. That felicity, when I reflect upon it, has induced me sometimes to say that were it offered to my choice, I should have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in a second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events for it, uh, uh, sinister events in it for others more favorable. But though this were denied, so even if you couldn't change anything, I should still accept the offer. Since such a repetition is not to be expected, the next thing most like living one's life over again seems to be a recollection of that life and to make the recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. So some of this is just, hey, I, I want to live my life over again. I want to think about the things I've done in life, but also very much so he wants to pass on these uh, concepts to the next generation and the next generation after that. He is thinking ahead, uh, not just for himself, but for other people. He talks about that felicity there for a second. Um, and he's talking about, um, you know, God's work in his life, which uh, Benjamin Franklin's religious life is one of those, you know, what's going on there? Sometimes he's accused of being an atheist or being um, uh, a, um, a deist. So a deist, somebody thinking maybe, you know, God made the world, but he just sort of wound it up and, and you know, set up the rules and walked away. But obviously this next section, I don't, at least in 70, 1771, he, he doesn't believe that. He says, and now I speak of thanking God. I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence, which leads me to the means I've used and gave them success. My belief of this induces me to hope though I must not presume that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in, in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear with a fatal reverse, which I may experience as others have done, the complexion of my future fortune being known to him only in whose power it is to bless us even in our afflictions. So here he is saying, yeah, you know, he feels like God's working in his life, that, that God has blessed him specifically, and that even if things go really bad, he knows that he means good for him. So uh, he's definitely not uh, atheistic, at least here in his, uh, in his writings about what he thinks in, the, in his autobiography. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's from a Puritan background. He's from, even though we know him to be a Philadelphia kind of person, yeah, he's transplanted from Boston, so he's got Puritan background. He wants to um, tell people, especially his, his children, about his upbringing, and he decides, you no, know, if we read some, some books that are like this, you know, my memoirs, life of whatever, um, generally they start with something like, I was born on this day, and my parents whose names were X. Um, here, he actually wants to give us some more information about his background. Ancestors are important. We've, we, we have kind of two ways of looking at it. We can say um, our ancestors are, um, you know, we're, we're directly connected with our ancestors and I'm very, very proud of them. And maybe what my ancestors have done, have done is more important than what I do. And then we have that flip where my ancestors don't mean anything and all my self-worth is held up in exactly what I do. So there are different schools of thought with the different cultures that come into North America, especially the English cultures that come in in the 18th century. And he's definitely of one where um, they're thinking of the ancestors. They're not just totally, you know, I don't really care about what, who my ancestors are. So he says, 
um, that he's gotten some notes about his ancestors from a relative. He says, from these notes, I've learned that the family uh, had lived in the same village, Ecton, in Northamptonshire for 300 years on a freehold of about 30 acres. Uh, aided by the Smith's business, which had continued in the family till his time, the eldest son, always being bred to that business, a custom which he and my father uh, followed as to their eldest sons. It seems like I missed something here. But he's talking about his, his, uh, his, the, the original ancestor here in, uh, in uh, Ecton. He says, When I searched the registers at Ecton, I found an account of their births, marriages, and burials from the year 1555 only, there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding that. By that register, I perceived that I was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations. That is really neat. There, you know, there's a lot of, is, is, their families aren't like, you know, our families. They're, they have lots of children. Uh, in fact, his father had 17 children, yet he was the youngest son of the youngest son going back five generations. Now, it's better to be the eldest son because then you generally get more inheritance. The youngest son doesn't necessarily get uh, more, you know, he doesn't get the, the best share of inheritance. And we kind of, you know, find that out as we go on. His father wasn't a smith because he was a youngest son. So he had a, had a lower uh, sort of, you know, a livelihood. Uh, his grandfather was Thomas. And his grandfather was born in 1598. Wow. Uh, he lived in Ecton until he was too old to follow business any longer. Uh, his grandfather had four sons who grew up. Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. So Benjamin Franklin's father was Josiah, that youngest son. And he goes on to talk about these sons, so his uncles. Um... But I want to break right there. Do you have anything to jump in with, Ryan, before I keep going? No, no, I don't have a lot. A lot there's just a lot of people are really appreciating this, and we want to make sure that you guys are involved with this just as much as John or I. So if you have insight, if you have questions, make sure to fire it in the chat, and uh, we'll have some time at the end to go over it. Very good. So, Thomas, his uncle... Um, brother of his father, the oldest one, bred to a smith under his father. Uh, being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an Esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish. He qualified himself for the business of Scrivener. Very interesting. Trained to be a blacksmith, but becomes a Scrivener, somebody who's writing. He was a chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for that county or town of Northampton and his own village, of which many instances were related of him, and much, uh, much taken notice of and patronized by the then Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January 6, old style, just four years to a day before I was born, the account we received of his life and character of some of the old people in, at Ecton, I remember, struck you, so he's writing to his son specifically, struck you as something extraordinary from its similarity to what you knew of my upbringing. Quote, had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. So, mm -hmm. like his soul moving from, you know, his uncle directly into him because they were so, so similar. And if you're thinking, what does it mean, um, January 6th, old style? We, we, I don't think anybody in, well, obviously, in living memory has had to deal with their calendars changing. Sometimes we fiddle around with, you know, how long a leap year is going to be, adding a second or two. But something was really goofy with the calendars pre, I think it was 1750-something, uh, where they had to totally change the calendar that the... the the sun and our calendar were so different that they had to like skip two weeks. So they uh, all of a sudden you have these calendar problems uh, where people are born and they have to say, oh yeah, that's the old style calendar they were born on such and such a day. Kind of a funny thing that happens right there in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, his uncle John 
was bred a dyer of woolens, but that's about all he talks about. John Benjamin, uh, which is his uncle also, was bred a silk dyer. When he means bred, he means trained up to be a silk dyer, serving a, an apprenticeship in London, and he was an ingenious person. Um, and so he was, again, a very um, uh, kind of a learned person. So again, were these different cultural groups, some of them were very, very interested in self-learning or, you know, whatever. So this guy was bred a silk dyer, but he was really interested in poetry, writing his own poetry. He had his own, this is um, his uncle Benjamin, he had his own shorthand that he invented for himself. He wrote down all, when he listened to a, a sermon on Sundays, he wrote every one of the sermons down as it was being you know, read out. Whoa, <laughs> that's incredible. And he had all these sermons in a big giant book. And uh, later on, um, Benjamin, the, our Benjamin Franklin talks about getting, you know, his, his uncle's book possibly being given to him as a, here, you want to study, you know, sermons? Here, have this giant, you know, pile of, of uh, sermons written in shorthand. So for a while, Benjamin Franklin, the one we're talking about, um, he knew how to read that particular shorthand. His uncle taught it to him. He also collected pamphlets, political pamphlets, uh, relating to public affairs, and he had a collection of them going from 1641 to 1717. So all these, he says, um, uh, eight volumes in folio, 24 volumes in quarto, and in octavo. So, uh, you know, full-size uh, folio books, giant ones, and then uh, quartos, probably this size, and then octavo, octavo smaller size books. So he had all these pamphlets sort of bound up together. Again, you know, wanting to collect these, you know, refer to them and all that. Um, then he talks about the, the uh, history of the family, back in England. He says, this obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary, when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery. They had got an English Bible, and to conceal and secure it, it was fashioned under with tapes uh, and within the covers of a joint stool. When my great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees, turning over the leaves, then under the tapes. One of the children would uh, stood at the door to give notice if he saw an apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. And in that case, the stool was stood down upon its feet when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my Uncle Benjamin, the family continued all the Church of England until about the end of Charles II's reign, when some of the ministers that had been outed for nonconformity, holding conventicles in Northamptonshire, Benjamin and Josiah adhered to them, and so continued all their lives, the rest of the family remaining with the Episcopal Church. So, it's a quick, it's a quick uh, interlude about what the religious life of these, his ancestors were like. So they're early Protestants, and it says continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary. So Queen Mary was uh, the, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, ruler coming into Great Britain, and there was sort of oppression against non-Catholics. Uh, so that's where this idea of they got an English Bible. So uh, English Bibles, it was frowned upon. The church didn't like that idea. They wanted to have just Latin Bibles so that you, you, if you wanted to understand the scriptures, you had to go to the priest. Uh, so these people had gotten an English Bible, but it was contraband. And so they, they took a stool and they had it up underneath the stool. And they'd flip the stool, read the book. Uh, the tapes are just little tapes that go over the pages to hold the book open. So the book's open the whole time, and uh, somebody's coming, you turn it, and you flip it back upside down. Then there's that, refer uh, that reference there to um, till the end of Charles II's reign. So Charles II is uh, 1682 is about the end of his reign, 1680s, and uh, there's, there's nonconformity holding convent conventicles. There's people that are not Church of England at the time. And so um, there's a split. So if you're if you're a nonconformist, you aren't part of the 
uh, Church of England, and so you know you're in trouble. So the family split there. There was the Puritans who were nonconformists, and then there was the con the conformists, as it were, Church of England. So part of the family, Benjamin and Josiah, went one way, and the other brothers went the other way. Um, uh, and <clears throat> interestingly, so it says um, so Josiah came to New England in about 1682, so right there at the end of uh, Charles II's reign. And uh, let's see, it says here, the conventicles having been forbidden by, by law and frequently disturbed, induced some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove to that country, New England, and he prevailed, uh, he was prevailed with to accompany them thither where they were expected to, to, uh, to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom. So, it seems like, at least family history-wise, yeah, they came to New England because of religious freedom. Um, not necessarily because, you know, it was a better place to earn money. This is definitely, um, maybe, it's not first wave um, um, Puritans. So the first wave of Puritans are coming over to, to New England previous to uh, 1640 or so. So there's all this, you know, there's, fi there's the fight of the English Civil War. We don't really understand here in America how important the English Civil War is to what happens in North America and different places. New England is New England because of what's happening with just prior to the English Civil War. And Virginia is Virginian because of the English Civil War. And the other side, turns out these two sides, Virginia and New England, are just dreaded enemies in the 1650s and it's you know interesting that you know that's this but we don't have that connection right at least i don't um he uh his his father marries um the second wife uh let's see here is abaya folger and she's the daughter of peter folger who was first generation puritan in new england Interesting, interesting. So, um, the Puritans are very religiously intolerant. Um, they didn't want people settling in New England that weren't Puritans. So, if you were Church of England, you're not really welcome. If you were Catholic, no, not so much. There are other places for you, please go there. If you were Quaker, get out of here. They just did not want Quakers. <laughs> but, Peter Folger writes a piece about, he writes a pamphlet. Um, in 1675, so before Franklin's family comes over, uh, and he writes this as a, as a uh, societal, you know, um, he's trying to change some minds here about what's going on. Uh, but he writes it in poetry. He writes it in verse. How often do we write in verse when we, you know, we want to write a, you know, a little piece and try to convince somebody? You know, I'm going to write an article on my blog and, and I'm going to write it in verse. We just, we just don't do that. But this whole thing is written in verse. And the topic was in favor of the liberty of conscience. So he wanted other people to be able to be in New England that had a different concept of, of religion. Uh, he wrote it in, on, in behalf of Baptists, Quakers, and other sectaries that had been under persecution. He doesn't just go so far as to say, I think this is a right thing to do. But he ascribed, uh, as he says, Indian wars and other distresses to that persecution, saying that God is judging them for their intolerance and he's judging them with Indian wars or, you know, that, that whole cultural conflict that they're having with Native Americans and other distresses. And likely you could say something like that, you know, disease and, uh, you know, different kinds of endemic diseases that were in that area. I mean, that's a big problem, especially with uh, children in the time period. Uh, if you lived to 18, you were doing good and you, you probably live your full life, but it was very easy to die of childhood diseases. So he's saying, hey, you know, maybe the problem, maybe the reason why we're having all these problems is because we're not, we're not being tolerant of some of these other religious ideas. Um, that's kind of a scary thing to say, to publish 
in Puritan New England in the 17th century. And, but what does he do here at the bottom, at the last line of it? He says, it's in verse, he says, uh, let me see if I can find the rhyme for it. Um, From Sherburn Town, where I now dwell, my name I do put here, without offense, your dear friend, I am Peter Fulgier. He says, he's willing to put, I live in this town, and here's my name if you want to come and see me. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's putting it out there. And that's his, uh, Benjamin Franklin's second wife's father that we're hearing about there. So let's get into uh, Benjamin Franklin's childhood. Do you have anything you want to jump in before I go there? I think that we're going to... Oh. I think we're going to try to hold a lot of the questions off until the end. Um, there, there's a little bit of conversation just about the need for coming here for religious freedom and mm-hmm. kind of a little bit of maybe confusion about that. But this comment says wasn't uh, wasn't the Church of England the only religion authorized by the crown? And that's why people were coming here? Is that Yeah, yeah. So, you know, English Civil War and, you know, what's going on before that, the Puritans come over because there's oppression uh, by Church of England. But, you know, and they come and settle, you know, 1620, 30, 40. But English Civil War starts right at the end of 1640 and into 1650. And that's when the Puritans sort of take over England and the tables are flipped upside down. And so what happens then? A whole bunch of, uh, you know, Church of England kind of people leave England and come to North America. Uh, so they, they go down to the Virginia area. So again, there's, there's this kind of pendulum swing going on here with religious uh, freedom in England, and it's driving different waves of people to uh, the New World. There was a comment that, that said that they would love to see the context of the political tracts that you were talking about. Yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of those things are available. They're a little hard to read. Uh, 17th century pamphlets um, are there. You can find a lot of them at places like archive.org or uh, books, uh, Google Books sometimes. Um, but that's a lot of digestion, and they're not easy to understand. Even this, at times, you know, the, it's like where he goes with the sentence is not how we would write things today. Uh, so they would be even harder to follow, but interesting when you understand the nugget. Sort of, I mean, you're a lot closer to Shakespearean English than you are to our English when you're reading those 17th century pieces, and Shakespearean English can be really, it's like, okay, now what did he mean? (laughs) (laughs) And, And somebody else was trying to get a handle on, were you basically saying that younger sons were put into trades that were cheaper to get into, and that was a general practice? Yeah, so, um, you know, younger sons, especially, in, and again, there's different kind of cultures going on in England at the time. Uh, so there's a primogeniture where, you know, the, the eldest son basically gets everything, right? Um, and then other cultures are not as much, they're much more willing to divide up a father's estate into different sons. But typically that first son is getting first dibs, uh, i.e. the name, right? Um, his great grandfather was Thomas, and his son was his first son was Thomas, and and so on and so forth. So just like the name came down, that main occupation came down. It's like okay, I'm a Smith. I'm going to train you as a Smith, and you're you know that's a that was a, a really good trade at the time. But as you get to younger sons, they don't get as much, and there's you know they may not. You don't want to train all your sons into the same job, so they would have to pick other jobs. And we'll see what happens with Benjamin himself as we go on, so it'll help under, help us understand that. Yeah, a couple of comments I think we'll have to just get a little further in the book. Somebody was right, wondering if maybe he regretted leaving his wife for such a long period of time and not being there when she passed. Yeah, that's woo way yeah. into the future. Um, in fact, it's probably not even covered uh, in the autobiography because... That's later life stuff that isn't in the autobiography. And boy, there is a ton of stuff to understand about Benjamin Franklin. While he is uh, a polymath and super smart and had all the connections with all these different people, yeah, he had life choices that we might look down upon. Um, 
but he was he was a he was a thinker and he was working through a lot of that stuff and you know uh, if everybody a lot of people you know it's like boy i want to live this kind of life and then they do something else so there are a couple of super chats i think that this is shant and jetty art i uh, love all you guys do thank you townsend's uh we've got a new member monster of the midway johnny so thank you for that and then jay sanders is in super chat found a townsend in a quarter cemetery in ohio Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe, we're going to try to keep most of the the comments about the book, I think. But if you want to get into the hobby, then you should contact if there's a local museum or fort that people dress in costume and just talk to them if they know anybody, any chapters around that do Revolutionary War reenactment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we're ready to go. Okay. So let's get into Benjamin Franklin mm, himself. Uh, my elder brothers were all put to different, put apprentices to different trades. So we're t- talking right on that again. I was put to a grammar school uh, at, the, at eight years of age. My father intended to devote me as a tithe of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early, as I don't remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar encouraged him in this purpose of his. My uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose as a stock to set up with, like he would just preach those same sermons again, (laughs) if I would learn his character, his shorthand. I continued, however, at grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and further was removed into the next class above it in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. So he was skipping right ahead. But my father in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which having no having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons he gave to his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention and took me from grammar school and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Brownwell, a Brownell. Uh, very successful in his profession, profession generally, and that by mild, encouraging methods. Under him, I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic and made no progress in it. At 10 years old, I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and a soap boiler, a business he was not bred to, as had... Um, as let me say, uh, <laughs> but had assumed on his arrival in New England on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for candles, filling dipping molds, and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, going on errands, etc. So there we go. Um, He says, I was put to a grammar school. Now, you might be confused. I'm put to a grammar school and then later on a school for writing and arithmetic. Uh, We think of grammar school as just being, we might use that generically here in in the United States. Maybe not. I don't think we use it a lot anymore. But, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we might use that term. And we just mean primary school, first six grades. That's not grammar school in the 18th century. Grammar school in the 18th century is Latin and Greek. And not writing it, as, as mentioned here in as another school, but reading it. So you're, you're, you're trying to read and understand Latin and Greek specifically for being a clergyman. So if you want to be a pastor in a, you know, a, a congregational church, Puritan church, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna have to be able to read the Bible in its originals so Latin and Greek is what you need to understand. So um, then, and, and he, he does really well in it. I mean, eight years old, and he's working on Latin and Greek, um, which, I mean, why don't we do that today, right? Um, and then his father's like, wait a minute, college, to keep, you know, keep going up, college is going to be really expensive, and he doesn't have a lot of money, and even when you get this, 
uh, you know, you're not going to be able to earn much money. Not very many people make a very good living in that time period being uh, in the church. It's not like Church of England uh, where it's, it, you know, you, could, you, can have, you can make a really good living at it. This is Puritan New England and not so much. So his father changes his mind and sends him to writing, not reading, writing and arithmetic. He already knows how to read. What he needs to learn is, is having a very good hand and writing. So he gets good at writing, although his arithmetic is not so good. So this is the kind of school you would send somebody if they want to be in business, if they want to be a clerk, if they want to be an accountant, as it were, for the time period. Um, so that's what he's learning at this point in this other school. Completely different kind of school and definitely a notch down. Um, he doesn't have to spend a lot of time there. Interestingly, Mr. Brownell, successful in his profession, but mild in encouraging methods. School teachers in the 18th century were not known for being little kindly folks. Um, you know, it was, it's uh, the, uh, um, there's a term for teaching that has slipped my mind right this second. Um, but it's, it's sort of Latin roots are to beat the child. It has more to do, you know, teaching has more to do with, uh, you know, keeping the child on task than it has to do with their kindly uh, learning methods. Not so with Mr. Brownell. Um, who is apparently a, a very nice teacher. But his father brings him home, not after many years in school. So from eight to 10, he goes to two different kinds of schools and then, you know, done. That's all the schooling that Benjamin Franklin has, even though we know him as a scientist and a philosopher and a mover in public matters. And here he is with two years of schooling, which we wouldn't call anything more than, you know, barely primary school. Um, and his father's business, he, he was trained as a dyer, but there's not a, a ton of, of cloth manufacturing in, in uh, North America at the time. And what it is, what cloth is being manufactured is done in, in, in subtle and uh, inexpensive colors and just called homespun. It's on, on purpose. And so there's not any great desire to have a lot of dyeing done, at least as a profession. And so his father becomes a tallow chandler and a soap boiler. So tallow candles are low end candles. They're slimy, they melt, they're made out of fat and it's just not nice. It's not a nice job. It's not, a, it's not a good smelling job. <laughs> and soap boiler, again, using that tallow again, uh, using rendered fat, mixing it with ashes, and making soap. So he's making soap and candles. Not a high-class profession whatsoever. Um, he, you know, there he is. He's cutting wick for candles, filling up dipping molds um, for casting candles. He's attending the shop, so he's being a shopkeeper, uh, and running on errands, you know, take this 100 pounds of soap and run it over to Mrs. Smith's house. So uh, that's, that's what he's doing. Uh, he didn't like it. He didn't like doing that job. Can you imagine? He had a strong inclination for the sea. Don't we all? Uh, <laughs> but his father was unhappy with the concept of him being... Uh, as, as working on the sea. That, again, not a, I think it was probably a little more glamorous, uh, but a uh, sailor's life is not a good life. They, they weren't known for being um, uh, moral. <laughs> they weren't known for being, uh, they just weren't known for being great guys. But regardless, so he liked uh, working with boats. He talks about that. Um, and he talks about being a leader. Uh, a leader of, you know, even then with kids. So here we go. Here he talks about his father a little bit. I think you may like to know something about his person and character. He had an excellent constitution of body, was of middle stature, but well set and very strong. He was ingenious. He could draw prettily, prettily was skilled a little in music and had a clear, pleasing voice. That, uh, so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin and sung withal, 
as he uh, sometimes did in the evening after business, mm -hmm. after the business of the day was over, it was extremely agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius too, and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools, but his great excellence lay in his sound understanding and solid judgment in prudential matters, both private and public. So he was still a, a really sought after member of the community for what he thought about things going on. And um, I think that was also talked about of his, that other, um, that other uncle, the one that died, uh, what was his name again? Yes, well, it was Thomas, I think, yeah. Um, his, that other brother was talked of in that same way. He was somebody that community members would, would come and seek after uh, for their advice. I like this part though. Well, there's good and bad here. Uh, at his table, at my father's table, he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with. And he always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse, which might tend to improve the minds of his children. By this means, he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life, and little or no notice was taken of what related to the victuals, or victuals on the table, whether it was well or ill-dressed, in or out of season, good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that other, uh, <laughs> that other thing of the kind. Uh, so that I was brought up in such, an in such a perfect inattention to those manners as to be quite indifferent of what kind of food was set before me, and so unobservant of it, that to this day, if I'm asked, I can scarce tell a few hours after dinner what I dined upon. This was, has been a great convenience to me in traveling where my companions have been sometimes very unhappy for want of suitable gratification of their more delicate, because better instructed, tastes and appetites. So two things. He made sure that his table, his, his family table where everyone was eating, that it was an edifying process. That's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're all together here for a meal. We're going to learn something. We're going to have conversation. Uh, of course, he didn't have necessary conversation with the children. That wasn't necessarily what you do as a father, but you would bring somebody else in to have a conversation with so they could listen and learn. And then, yes? Speaking of style, Tony just was able to pop in. He's wondering. He's trying to catch up. What Whoa. page are we on? Uh, we are on page nine of this version of the, uh, the uh, autobiography, Benjamin Franklin. Um, so there's the um, what you're going to learn at the table and then the idea of food. Now, this uh, inattention to food. Now, I'm sure his wife or his cook was very unhappy that it's like, whatever. We're going to eat whatever you put at the table. We're not going to complain or say we liked it. Um, there's good and bad in that, but it's definitely a very Puritan thing. Uh, that they were, uh, they weren't interested in gratifying their senses for the fun of it. Um, so, in, in, in even to the opposite, they uh, on purpose created foods that were bland and boring to keep people from being distracted by their food, spending too much attention on their food when they should be attending to other things in their lives. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, you can take that too far. I, I think the sentiment is, is interesting, but you can definitely go off the deep end with that kind of a thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, we hear about people dying early, and boy, in that we were doing that Horn live stream the other uh, day. We were talking about the average lifespan in that one particular town where it was only like 36 or something, and the average Horn worker uh, their families would only live to 16 <laughs> as an average. Um, Josiah, his father, and uh, he lived to 89. That's pretty goodly. And his mother, Abaya, she lived till 85 years of age. So 
Again, if you survived your childhood, you might live a, a good number of years. Um, so, you know, his father, his father realizes he doesn't want, I'm going to, I'm going to stop after this little section. Uh, his father uh, decides, knows he doesn't want to be a tallow chandler. And probably his father says, I don't want you to be a tallow chandler either, uh, which would have a, a better career. So his father took him around looking at other jobs. He says, uh, he therefore sometimes took me on a, uh, to walk with him and see joiners, so uh, carpenters, uh, bricklayers, turners, wood turners, uh, braziers, etc., uh, at their work, and he might observe that he might observe my inclination and endeavor to fix it on some trade or other on land, not at sea. <laughs> it has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and it has been useful to, to me, having learnt so much by it, as to be able to do little jobs myself in my house when a workman cannot readily be got, uh, to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intention of the making of the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade. My uncle, uh, my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was trained in that business uh, in London, being uh, about that time established in Boston, I was sent to be with him some time on liking, but his expectations of a fee with me displeased my father, and I was taken home again. Uh, sometimes you would pay to apprentice your child to a trade, and apparently his father didn't like the idea of paying uh, for that. And here we go. From a child I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands was ever laid out in books. Pleased with Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's work in separate little volumes. I afterwards sold them to enable me to buy R. Burton's historical collections, with, which were small Chapman's books, and cheap, 40 or 50 in all. A little chapbook is just a very, very inexpensive, 5, 10, 20 page little pamphlet. So we had all these little uh, historical pamphlets. This book bookish inclination at length determined my father to make me a printer, though he already had one, <laughs> James, of that profession. Whew. Okay, I'm going to come up for air. Have a drink. <laughs> oh man, we don't have uh, a whole lot of questions at this point i think you're covering it well enough but um well, the one thing that now that we've got more people in here one thing that we are very curious to know is uh, what you want to get out of this you can talk about that a little john if you want right so you know this is a on this is a youtube book club and i i didn't look to see how anybody else did this i said well we're gonna we're gonna just run at this thing just crazy with scissors and all that and see what happens when we just try this out in the live stream uh so if you've got ideas about maybe a way to make it better, you can jump in. Uh, but again, this basically, I'm going to read through sections of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing and kind of pull out sections, comment on them. And, you know, this has taken about the amount of time I expected to. It's going to take us a while to get through this book. Uh, but when there's a pertinent section, you know, let's jump out, pull it out. Let's interpret it. We can read this book today and we miss a lot unless we understand sort of the underlying things. Remember Benjamin Franklin, this is the world he lived in. He didn't realize that we wouldn't understand different parts of this, like, what does grammar school mean? Oh, it's just first grade. No, <laughs> it isn't learning the grammar of our language, it's learning the grammar of other languages. So uh, those kind of terms, he figured everyone who was reading this would understand them. So we needed a lot of kind of groundwork to understand what's going on in this book, uh, a lot of cultural interpretation and time frame interpretation. So um, to make it kind of come to life, that's what, that's what this is about. Um, I figured we would kind of jump through this 10 and 12 pages at a time. I want you to, you know, read ahead and have some ideas um, and I will read it and I'll do what I do. And if you've got questions about particular things that are in the text, whether I read them or not, you can ask about them in the chat or in the description section or in the uh, comment section down below. We'll try to have some of those kind of prepped for future episodes, questions that people had about the past piece, probably cover that in the beginning, do these readings and then cover questions here at the end. 
Yeah, so one of the reasons that uh, we decided to sell the book with a notebook is so that when you're doing your reading at home, yep. you're able to make some notes along the way so that you can ask them those questions or you can talk about those notes as we go and everybody gets the benefit of your questions or your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, and just like the, you know him saying, hey, I wrote this down on purpose so that you know, it would be edifying to other people, you know, other family members. Uh, and really, at the beginning, he only he only wrote it for other family members. But uh, just that idea that I'm going to write this down so that it's there in the future. This is that same thing. You know, we we do this video, and it's going to live here on the YouTube channel for who knows how long. And lots of people will be able to you know enjoy it and learn from it. And you and you're part of that. Okay, so uh, speaking of style, Tony just threw in a super chat that says, uh, do you have a schedule for these? Um, I'm hoping to do them every Wednesday as we, as we progress forward. I may speed it up or slow them down uh, depending on the reaction to them and what it does on the channel um, because you guys tell me in one way or the other, YouTube tells me whether I should do this kind of thing or not uh, and how it should be done. And uh, you gotta, we gotta fall down a lot before we can know exactly how it's gonna work. So your feedback is gonna help us understand how this should should uh, change. And most of the comments that are coming in say that your insight is what is really interesting. They can read the book on their own. Your right. insight in this conversation, right. that's what they're looking for. So we're gonna lean on that. And uh, how, do you have any idea how much you're looking to cover next week? If I read less and talk more, um, I would say that I would jump in, I, and I haven't read ahead enough in the, you know, in this sense uh, to have a good feel for it. But I would say if we cover 10 pages, let's say that we can do the next 10 to 15. Okay. So if, if you folks at home want to read the next 15 pages or so, maybe get to page 25 or 30, then we'll be able to go over that and John will give his insight. And you guys can also do that in the chat, and it'll be really great. Yeah, yeah. This I, I love this book in that it isn't that it's from this person's point of view, from Benjamin Franklin himself's point of view. You know, we can read books about the life of Benjamin Franklin, and it's helpful, it's good. But what does he think is important, mm. right? So it's like. He doesn't, he's not going to tell us a lot about, well, I was five and this thing happened, right? <laughs> or did I like tallow channeling? He doesn't even, it's like, I didn't like it. That's all he has to say. <laughs> uh, but he does have these other little anecdotes and little, you know, rabbit trails. It isn't written in a super, you know, stiff sense, but in a more personable, this is how I'm going to talk to my children sense. So it's, it's a great book for, for uh, understanding. And this is, Again, early. This is pre-Revolutionary War uh, that helps us understand how it's you know, going to turn out later on. So Askren by KO, I think is how you say that, that uh, handle. It's a new member. Also, sending in a super chat and says, I don't know how super chats work, but I love <laughs> the content. This is the book that will get me out of my reading slump. Oh, it's a it's a good one, and you know what? It is not a you know if you're like oh this is big. It's not a big book really. Uh, his part is only um, 180 pages long, and it's pretty easy reading. Uh, it's you know it's a little convoluted, obviously, with 18th century reading. But I think all the more so, it's really important to dig into those and kind of understand them because uh, it makes our brains work a little bit differently reading things that are written you know 250 years ago um uh, okay reading shakespeare is hard <laughs> this is a lot easier uh, but it's good for us to you know dig into different kinds of readings so right now i'm putting the link for okay so this link right now is for a version of this book that is missing two pages <laughs> And they're, they're a little cheaper. We don't have the book <laughs> back in stock yet, but we're working on getting it with those two pages included back in stock. But you can go ahead and buy these up for a little cheaper. Those two pages probably don't matter much anyways, right? What we'll do is we'll print them on a separate sheet of paper and slide them in there. So you'll have them. There they just go. won't be bound in. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to get the exact copy that John is reading off of, there you go. You can get it with the notebook or without the notebook, and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Kinter Crafts is sent a super chat. Thank you very much for that. 
And it just looks like people are pretty excited about it. So. Good. Well, I'm excited. I think it's just such a good work as we dig in. And this is some of the most important part, this early life part. Um, he's going to, we're going to move into him being uh, in the printer shop. And it just isn't like that. It isn't easy. This gets really complicated and weird things happen to him. I mean, I would just, this is weird. Uh, so uh, this is going to be, a, it's going to be very uh, instructive for us about what life is like as an apprentice, mm -hmm. because we don't use apprenticeships anymore. And we don't have any concept of this idea of, you know, a 12 year old signing a contract and being mm -hmm. held to a, you know, being held to a particular contract, uh, doing, you know, doing a particular job, what happens if you don't like it, lots of apprentices were, were mistreated. Um, you know, I, you know, abused in certain ways, you know, or just, you know, ethically abused, just like, well, we're making them do things we really ought not to, or work too hard or whatever. Um, that's life in the 18th century. We can look at apprenticeship and say, oh, it's all great and wonderful. Uh, not so much. There's a reason why some kinds of apprenticeships have disappeared. <laughs> so a lot, a lot to learn. This next section is going to be great. Hopefully he'll get into his own print shop. We'll see how many pages we can get through. Wow. Wednesdays at four o'clock. Wednesdays. Eastern. Yes. Wednesdays, four o'clock Eastern. Uh, they will be available on YouTube after the fact. If you can't make it for the live stream, that's okay. You can put comments in the, the comment section, and we will try to get to them in the next live stream. This is going to be good, guys. A lot to learn. Chuck Baker's in Super Chat right now. Ben Franklin, my favorite historical figure. I have a Ben Franklin bobblehead on my <laughs> desk right now. Glad to see him get the time he deserves. I'm sure Ben Franklin would be proud like that. to be a bobblehead. <laughs> I think he's a little kind of, I think he would think that was funny, which some of the other founding fathers maybe not so much. <laughs> All right, it's time for us to say farewell. Okay, thank you guys for coming into this live stream. Thank you, Ryan, for doing the hard work behind the console. Um, you guys help make this channel happen. And when I do weird things like this, like, hey, let's do a book club and let's do a live stream and la, la, la. It's you guys that help me do this. So thanks for being here in this live stream and being part of the chat, being part of uh, you know the audience, and I hope you've had a great time. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you on Friday's live stream, live to Nutmeg Tavern. Thanks for watching. <laughs>